Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Get notifications. Okay. Ooh, there we are. Okay, here we go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Today is a very special day for me because we're going to be talking to someone who I grew up, well, I want to say grew up, I'm not that much younger than Steve, but um, I enjoyed watching his Dotto Tech, uh, Tech channel for two decades. I'm a Canadian and I, I live in Toronto and his show was like a very happening thing for a long time and I really enjoyed watching all his great stuff. And, and then after a few decades of doing his nationally broadcast show, um, Steve tr transitioned into doing more stuff around social media, online marketing and community building and internet marketing. And, and now he has the amazing Dotto check channel that I'm a huge fan of. He's got well over a few hundred thousand subscribers and it's a very popular channel and I, I'm a subscriber there and enjoy it. And we're going to have the opportunity to talk to Steve today about screencasting and I'm so excited and welcome Steve. Thanks a lot Gord, looking forward to it. It's such a thrill to have you here and and I was hoping that before we get started maybe you can just share with folks, um, I, I, I mean I'm sure I could talk much longer about the things that you're doing but I'd like to hear from you about some new and interesting stuff you started up recently on YouTube and you got other other stuff going on, can you share with us? Oh yeah, well we're uh, we've about what is about uh, two three months ago I split the YouTube channel into I started doing a vlog, uh, which was ostensibly going to be more productivity stuff. On my main YouTube channel is productivity, uh, how to how to technology stuff, and uh, we were looking at growing the channel and uh, we started doing a vlog at the beginning of this year, just the beginning of 2018, and the vlog was supposed to be about productivity stuff. But I wasn't, you know, productivity is fun, but I, I, when you start vlogging, you start getting more into your personal life and, you know, your passion projects. And I started talking more and more about what it was like being a baby boomer in the digital age and, and the things that, the, 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 the issues that we faced. And uh, it, it got some traction and I was getting lots of feedback and I really enjoyed it. And uh, so uh, it, it kind of started leading me down a path of spending more time talking to our generation, baby boomers and Gen X about uh, what our life is like in the digital space. And so that led me to a little bit more research. And, and I discovered something. Do you realize that in North America alone, 12,000 people retire every day? Wow. That's a huge number. And many are not in a financial position to retire or they're not ready to retire. They don't want to retire. And the job market, as you well know, the job market doesn't want anybody with a little bit of gray in their hair anymore. Uh, so. That led me into the space where I started talking a lot more about how we can reinvent ourselves and use social media to, to, uh, to remain relevant and to build, build businesses to our own side hustles. So, I've, so, so that's uh, kind of become my thing these days is really a lot more interested in talking to that community. So just actually later this week, uh, we launch our uh, a podcast on that topic. My vlog has been concentrating on that topic for a while, but I started a podcast that I'm calling Gray Matters. Uh, which is uh, about those of us in the gray zone with a little touch of gray yeah. here or there and uh, talking about, you know, social marketing as creating a side hustle and learning how to take advantage of all of the, all of the online world in order to reinvent ourselves and, uh, and remain relevant, maybe make income as we move ahead, that sort of stuff. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. It's uh, it, as I say, it's a passion project, but it's just, it's, it's time. You know, the, I, I think most baby boomers, most Gen Xers, have a sense that social, the social space, the online space of Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and all of that is the domain of the, um, uh, of the millennials, not necessarily, it's not necessarily a space, but I don't, I don't believe that's the case at all. Yeah. So, uh, now, now well, just out of curiosity, are we going to be feeding video through or cause I, we still have your slides up. Um, oh really? Yeah. I thought, I thought we're looking at. At least I'm not getting it on the feed that I'm looking at. I'm just still seeing a slide. 
Um, well, let's just check with everyone in chat. Like I'm, I'm properly in, in, um, you might have preview. You might not have sent it to program the program through. Oh, thank you, Steve. Let's check. No, it says I'm streaming all mm. through. Okay. Well, I don't and see it. And it sends good. I'm um, just seeing a slide here. That's okay. Okay. So simply Beth says, oh, now it's I have changing. A, now, no, oh, there they, I am. They say they see both of us. Now they do. Okay. That's, well, that's cool. Interesting. I, okay. I wasn't before. All good. Now, I appreciate the chat. I'll be far more careful. <laughs> I, I can face my camera now that I can see us. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, Steve, what's interesting about, like, I mean, I got hooked on your vlog when you started it. And um, I just love the topics that you're bringing out, you know, about dealing with, you know, uh, facing retirement and, or being let go and dealing with financial challenges and, and, and coming into a new space. You know, you have, mm -hmm. you know, been working in the air, air, area for quite a while. I kind of got forced there um, because I yeah. was let go. So I'm kind of like one of these like model citizens for the topic of your show. So I'm, I'm really enjoying everything that you're doing and it seems to generate a ton of engagement. And I'm, I'm really enjoying to see the feedback, the stories that people are sharing. And that's kind of how we got to meet too through your vlog, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's 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 generating quite a community. It's it's been a lot of fun uh, as it goes along. But it is uh, it well. It'll be uh, it'll we'll see. We'll, let's talk again next year. Let's see what sort of an impact we have over the next year with people's lives. That, that's that's going to be great. So let's let's um, dive into our topic t for today. And what absolutely. I wanted to, to to let everyone know, we're going to be doing like a kind of a deep dive into screencasting and um, sort of like the different nuances in there because people have a perception in their mind what is screen screencasting. So we want to sort of like demystify what screencasting is and help people understand to position it in yep. amongst other tools and technologies that they use. So Steve, I'm going to just pop up a couple of slides here to just intro what we, we're uh, talking about here and hopefully people will see these things come through in OBS. So mm -hmm. here we go. Our first slide is what is screencasting? And this is a definition I got from Wikipedia, so I just want to share it. A screencast is a digital recording of, a, of computer screen output, also known as a video screen capture, often containing audio narration. So as we know, Steve, the, the tools for the longest time were, were only known as screencasting, right? As about video capture tools. Isn't that correct? For a long time. Yep. Yep. And, and, and so um, in, in the next slide, what I want to show is and discuss with Steve is there are so many uses that people may not be aware of that screencasting falls into. And a lot of people are probably doing it anyways for their content that they're producing, whether it's for marketing, business or work, et cetera, and uh, YouTube. So Steve, can you share with us, and I have on screen, you know, a bunch of examples, how screencasting has influenced you your business and the products and things that you you do to share with everyone. Absolutely. And you know, here's the thing. I disagree with uh, Wikipedia on their description of what screencasting is. Okay. Um, so so for for me, screencasting is desktop video. It's the fact that we've moved from the uh, we've moved from needing dedicated pieces of hardware in order to publish and create video to being able to create it all with our desktop. So it, you, now the screen can be a part of it, but it's using your computer as your production platform. So what we're doing right now is a form of screencasting as far as I'm concerned. We're working, we're doing a live stream broadcast through our computers using our computer as a switcher, as a production studio. And to me, that's what screencasting is all about. And what, what happens is the screen can become a character in your piece if you choose to. But if not, it, you can still use all of the screencasting tools to create your video as, as we're doing right now. So I, I, I like to broaden it up. I, see, I come from a desktop publishing background. I, right. came from a, I came from the when the computer suddenly became the publishing platform and you didn't need a dedicated typesetter and linotype and, and camera and com composition and, and, and pull all the pieces together to, before you went to the printing press is you could all of a sudden do it all on the computer. And you didn't have to do all of the steps all mm. the time on the computer, but you could. So when I stopped doing my TV show back in 2010, 2011, um, I didn't do anything for a little while. But when I started to say, how can I reinvent myself in the online space? I started mm -hmm. to play with a tool called ScreenFlow on the Mac, right. which was, is a very inexpensive but quite powerful screen casting tool or screen recording tool on the Mac. And it allows you to record and it allows every 
digital asset you have to be able to be pulled together onto into your video. So the digital assets we have are our webcam, our microphones, any graphics or files that we can see on the computer screen, we can incorporate in the video. And at that point, that's what screencasting is. You know, it, it, to me, it's to me, it's desktop video production. Uh, and it's way easier and way more convenient to produce those videos using a tool like Camtasia or ScreenFlow than it is trying to use a tool like, uh, you know, a dedicated video application like Final Cut or, or, or something along that line <coughs> in order to create the video. And the reason is you have with screencasting software, you have object control over what happens on the computer screen. So you zooming in and out, moving in and out of, uh, yeah, zooming in and out of the screen, doing transitions, adding elements to the screen is just a far more natural process and far easier. And you have a lot more control over each step of the way of screencasting. And then you've got additional tools like being able to designate your cursor as an element. It's another asset, right? And be able to change the size of it, you know, make it pulse radio, you know, kind of radio buttons as it, as, as you click on it, adding all those sorts of assets as well. Uh, and what it does is it becomes a phenomenal storytelling platform uh, that allows you to create and compose video as easily as we used to kind of create word processing documents. At least that's my take on it. Yeah, so that it, it brings up um, a number of sort of interesting angles to me because, um, again, I'm playing on, on you know, the, the words screencasting and people conventionally didn't think of the screencasting tools like ScreenFlow and Camtasia, which are like two outstanding products, you know, um, uh, ScreenFlow primarily yep. is just a Mac solution, right? And Camtasia works on Mac and and Windows. And the tools, are, like you're saying, are very... I think they're powerful editors enough that, like you're saying, we can do a lot to improve and polish the story that we want to tell that formerly, I'm saying in the past, people didn't associate with them. So I know I'm, I'm just sort of talking about when the the, the normal, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Positioning that people may yeah. place these in, uh, I think causes a bit of an oversight of the potential of using these tools. Now, you'll notice that if you look on the um, sales pages for these products, that they call themselves screen recorders and video editors. So it's like more like an all-in-one kind of solution. And it's not, they don't label themselves screencasting in that way anymore, which yeah. I find quite interesting. Absolutely. And at the end, and what it means is that you can compose and you can create video. Like I, I think that I can create a video in less time than it takes me to write a blog post. Oh, and, and it's so much more flexible and so much more valuable than a, than, a, than a straight up written blog post as far as I'm concerned. And then you asked about use case. If you can create good, compelling, effective video easily with, a, with you know, fairly low barriers to entry, the places that you can start to use those video are almost endless. I, I use screencast video as video emails to thank people, to send personal messages to people. Mm -hmm. We use it, of course, for all the video for our YouTube channel. We use it for, I use it for creating online course content. We deliver online courses and we, and almost all of that content is created as video. I use it to create, uh, we use, I use screencast to create the main content for my webinars. Every week on Wednesday, I do a live tutorial webinar. And I pre-record, I pre-record 20 or 30 minutes of that video, uh, the demo section as a screencast, which means that I can make it tighter. I can edit it down. I can increase the information density that's delivered in that time. I'm not kind of wandering my way through it and doing a live slideshow. Instead, it's pre-recorded packaged with nice camera moves in and out so that the menus are described so people have a higher, higher amount of information and more learning incorporated. And I do that. I, I've got something for everybody. I'm, I'm going to put a link in here which is a link to a mini course that I created called uh, how I create video in less time than writing a blog. Mm -hmm. And so there, that's the link that I just put in there. So that's a free course that walks through the tools that I use and the techniques that I use to create a video. And I base that on the, the claim that I can, that if you and I sit down starting at the same point with the, the knowledge of the topic and you have to write a blog post and I can create a video with the same content, I'll have the video done and uploaded before you finish. <laughs> the blog post. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And and what um, you know, 
what I, what I really like is is how you do your your webinars. I there are, are isn't that style called like a hybrid webinar because yeah, it's a combination yeah. of a pre-recorded component which you did through screencasting approach and tightened it up and then on top of that you have live chat flowing and guests yeah. and and while the video's on you're even able to engage in the conversation. So it's just like a yeah. a really amazing experience and you're like one of the only people I've seen that do this. Like you do this weekly. So it's yeah, like I'm, a surprised, lot of... I'm surprised more people don't use this technique. And I, I don't know why they don't, but I, to me, it's the most effective way of producing a webinar. But, you know, I did live television for years mm -hmm. and live radio. But when you're on live TV, it's a, there's a lot of moving parts to make it work and to make it really magical. Uh, and webinars can be even better because you have the additional chat happening, which creates social proof and creates all this extra energy. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the different pieces that you put in place to do a webinar or to do a live television show, you've got, of course, the host and the content, uh, and then you've got to have some assets. You've got to, in television, we called it B-roll, right? We'd throw to a tape, we'd throw to a tape, and it allowed us to catch our breath while the video was rolling, and you queued up the next segment, and then you went to the next segment if you're doing, if you're doing, if you're doing a live broadcast. So people don't give themselves that grace when they do a webinar. They sit there and they launch the webinar and they got their slideshow and then they switch back and forth between screen, screen sharing the slides. And they're so concentrated and focused on content that they have trouble reading and following what's happening in the chat. Mm -hmm. And which means that the audience gets kind of left, you know, you, you don't take advantage of the fact that they're there engaging with you in real time. And it's a hard thing to do to engage in the chat at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and also then you also deliver a slideshow and you're delivering it in real time and you're stumbling and you forgot what the next point is going to be and you do all that kind of stuff. Whereas if you can record the main part of your demonstration, the main, the main content for your webinar, if you pre-record it, now it takes a couple of hours to do, but yeah. you pre-record it, you can then edit it down, you can tighten it up, you can make sure that it's exactly what you want to say. You're first of all respecting your content a lot by spending time packaging it. But mm -hmm. you're also respecting your audience's time by making sure that you deliver the most valuable content to them in that space. So that's, and then you can, what I call increase the information density of the webinar by while the video is running, you jump into chat and you talk to people in the chat and you answer the low hanging fruit questions and you make sure you mark all of the questions that you want to answer when you come live for the Q and A. So in a one hour webinar where I'll probably cover, I think 20% or 30% more content more relevant content than somebody else's webinar that's in the same place. And the proof's in the pudding. You know, we do a live webinar each week and let me just take a look. I'll tell you right now, this coming week, we are doing one on um, if Evernote is being surpassed by Notion. Right. The productivity one. We have 1,162 people registered for it as of right now. Wow. And we're not live till tomorrow morning. We'll have another 300 or 400 people join that webinar. So we're going to have 1,400 people signed up for the webinar by the time we go live. Yeah. And we'll have a third of them. We'll have 320, 330 people in the room while we do the webinar. And we do that every week. And if you're mm -hmm. in social media, you know, doing a webinar to three, mm -hmm. 400 people live a week, that's a ter terrific way to build a community, I got to say. Yeah, I, I, I think it's outstanding. And then I also like now you're doing the concept of um, a webinar recap even. So yes. you get even longer. So, so can you speak about the repurposing yeah. and some of the model? Like, because because that's, again, you're using tool, your screen flow and you're tightening things up, right? And and that's the beauty well, of, of, of... For social yeah. marketers, I mean, I've yeah. been using the webinars the way that other people might use a podcast to build their community. And I've been trying to figure out how to leverage that content as much as possible. And the web, we've been doing live webinars now for two years. We started in January of 2017. And so this is our 88th or 87th live webinar in this series that we're delivering tomorrow. Uh, I should give you the link. Let me give you the link if anybody wants to sure. register. So they can they can get they can see what happens. So here's what happens. So so the webinars for me are uh, obviously they're a massive oh. amount of work. So you have to make sure that you get a lot of traction out of any doing this many webinars. So the, we deliver the webinar live. Obviously, there's value there. Uh, and then I've got a whole Patreon campaign. I've got a whole way that it supports us revenue wise as well. Even though the webinars are free, mm -hmm. I still manage to make money from them. I'll explain that in a moment. But then. I wanted to take the webinars and I wanted to find a way that I work so hard on the content to, to make it a little bit evergreen. And I'm not a big fan of the full webinars or the evergreen webinars where you just watch a recording without context and that right. sort of stuff. 
So I won't do that. And I certainly won't present a webinar pretending to be live when it's not live. I abhor that. <laughs> so what I started to do was I said, you know what, this, I think people are just kind of interested in the main topic and the kind of the really the 30,000 foot stuff that we talk about. So I started to take the webinar and edit it down into a 10 minute webinar. And so I just took a highlight reel of the webinar and I started to post that each week as a standalone video. And it's not, it's not up to the same standard as my regular videos because it's, you know, it's, it's just little snippets. Yeah. But they're doing quite well. Every one of them is getting a certain amount of traction. It doesn't do as well as my regular videos, but the comments that I get from my community, they appreciate the fact that they get the highlights without having to spend the whole hour. And actually our webinars, even though I book them for an hour, they usually last an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Because there's all, so many questions. We, with 400 people in the room, there's a lot of questions to answer. So they typically come in at about an hour and 20, which is a really large commitment of time if you're staying yeah. there live. And we always make sure we wrap things up at the top of the hour. We, we commit, ask people to commit to an hour. And then, and then we lose maybe a third of them at the top of the hour. And then the rest of them stay on and we answer questions till we're done. So uh, I, but go ahead. I was going to say, I would also think that that helps support your Patreon community because if people missed it, because you you actually pull the the live after forty eight hours, right? And then yeah. then then the, that recap stays, but and so that's there, and it and it's also a draw to for people that want to go and, and and dive deeper for those experiences, among other things, in Patreon. Right? Yes, yeah. So the a big part of our kind of our ongoing revenue stream is. We deliver the webinars for free, but then we take an archive of all of our webinars and we host them for our patrons. So Dottotech is supported through Patreon mm -hmm. and we've got about 700 people that support us on Patreon. And the main benefit they get, they get half price on some of our courses, but the main benefit is they get access to the archive of all 87 of these tutorial webinars mm -hmm. that we have delivered. So there's a really good knowledge base there that they have access to. And, uh, and it's of course far more detailed than they would get out of watching the little 10 minute recap. Yeah. I think that's a great, great approach to, um, building, um, you know, a, a fort, so to speak, as you go on yeah. making it stronger. Um, so, so Steve, how, how long does it take you with, um, uh, to, to ed edit that replay? Okay. Oh. It's a pretty quick, is it, it's a pretty quick thing to do or you have to <sighs> actually quicker. watch the whole thing, right? It's, so well, that, I've done that's it. the thing. It, it's, it's usually my own stuff that I'm editing, so it's not too bad. Yeah, because uh, I most of my webinars I'm the host of and I do the main content. Uh, increasingly, I've had some guests on and they do a part of it. Like tomorrow, uh, Francesco D'Alessio is going to be doing the content on Notion, uh, mm -hmm. which should be right. really good. So he's already pre-recorded the video and all, and all of that sort of stuff for me. So um, we uh, actually I got to check on that now that you I better <laughs> check, make sure everything's ready for tomorrow. You've just tweaked my man, tweaked my memory. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it takes me, well, doing the, doing the research, but I don't know how long research takes me, but recording the video that I use in the, uh, in each week's webinar typically takes me both two to three hours to do the 20 minute, 20 minutes with 30 minute video, maybe two and a half hours to put it all together. And then once the webinar is over, editing the webinar is probably another two hours of time editing and packaging and getting the replay out and all of the supporting content for it so it's, it's you know between not all it's it's a good full day's work yeah. along with delivering Absolutely. the webinar yeah uh to to keep this webinar so it's a big commitment so i have to get a lot out of it but it does it's it's my biggest list builder you know every week it generates 50 to 100 new email addresses on my mail list nice and every yeah. week it generates a couple of new patrons sign up as a result and every week it certainly helps to uh, uh, helps to bind me more closely to my community because I've delivered another webinar value and, and more people get to know us because we always have between 60 and 100 p people that have never been in one of our webinars before in our webinar and some of those people will like us and some of them will hate us and the ones <laughs> that like us so there's a good chance that they become contributing members of our community over time uh, so but it's staying the course it's consistently staying the course and doing it every week that's the that's the yeah key. I think the consistency is a huge factor and because people like look forward to the webinar Wednesday they know what's coming you announce it well enough in advance they sign up and and it you know gets promoted through the, the the fact that it's a live event there it's all this is you know the right way to do things as you're demonstrating there Steve which yeah, we appreciate absolutely. so um what I wanted to ask in terms of the screencasting compared to other editing experiences um 
when have you had need to really have to go beyond something like a Camtasia or a ScreenFlow for capabilities? Like, have you, like, if you were to say percentage wise, like, I, I think I recall you telling me that you do occasionally use a Final Cut. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I use Final Cut more just because I want to. Um, like, for the vlog, sometimes Final Cut works well. If you're doing things, if you're doing B roll, fancy video, like speed ramping videos, or you're doing a lot of color correction or things like that, screencasting software is underpowered for that sort of work yeah um so if you're doing artistic type video uh it's not for you but if you're doing pedestrian tutorial videos it's perfect yeah um so i and, and I, so i i do all my I, I do pretty much everything in screenflow yeah you know it's funny um i always try to look at the effects that are you know more of the the, the domain of something like a final cut pro like i'll take a speed ramp concept and i'll play with a combination of clip speeds and animation points and trim a, a thing down and work with easing and i can pretty much simulate a lot of those more powerful things but sometimes yeah. it may take a lot a lot of effort and it may not but i i'm amazed that there's a lot of power there in there with these tools that if the people that um want to go there to take it to the next level that potential is yeah. there which i think a lot of people um, kind of don't recognize that they have that kind of opportunity. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, you know, and you can, if you know, for YouTube production, I mean, if you're going to broadcast or anything like that, you need a more professional tool. Don't get me wrong. Screencasting is for YouTube delivery or for Vimeo delivery yeah. of tutorial training, webinar, um, you know, that sort of content. It's not, it's not for full on entertainment. Like I don't right. expect, you know, but, but if I was a vlogger who was out and about shooting B-roll all the time out, you know, shooting outside and I was always incorporating drone footage and other things, yeah. I probably wouldn't be, I, I, I can say for sure, I wouldn't be using a right. screen flow for that. You right. know, I'd be using, I'd be using the Adobe suite or I'd be using Final Cut for that sort of stuff. Right. Right. That makes sense. So, um, I, I'd like to, to step into another interesting area where things are starting to get more um, pronounced and that is live streaming in terms of the capabilities of what can one can actually put into the production and these tools also give the ability <laughs> pardon me to record so you can start to put in things now like lower thirds picture in picture um yeah, yeah. you know transition stingers and you can put a lot of those things in you now become a producer and that means putting stuff in and a lot of stuff in up front and you know there's tools like you know wire wirecast vmix ecam live and mac world right and um yeah there's there's so much you know capability now in a lot of these tools that the live streamer can really up level that that game so i find it interesting that i start to look at these things okay now i'm trying to think about what would i want to put in in pre-production and what would be in post-production because, because you know, I, I, I don't mind doing the edit, but for many people mm -hmm. that just don't have the skills capability to dive into these tools or want to expend the energy, it, it it's yep. really up the up the game. Like, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know the the more imagination you have and the more effort that you put in to the polish that you put together for your live stream or uh, any production. The, ultimately, the more it's going to pay off. I mean, look at all the little pieces that you've built for this, you know, mm -hmm. all the little elements and all the little pieces of B-roll that you built for this. Yeah. Uh, you know, composing those and putting them all together in Wirecast is not that easy. Uh, but if you do them all just as little as little as little video files in in a ScreenFlow or in a Camtasia, you can compose some pretty nice bumper pieces and some pretty nice inserts pretty easily that you can then mm -hmm. add as digital assets. Um, so it's really your imagination and not taking shortcuts is, is recognizing that you can create this stuff and, and kind of letting your imagination run free and saying, oh, why can't I have a, you know, a, a, a three second bumper that introduces the sponsor segment or something like that and, and just and just doing it as opposed to uh, as opposed to the way that 99 percent of live streamers do, which is just they don't add any digital assets at all, maybe lower yeah. third. And that sort of stuff, but they don't actually incorporate anything else. Yeah, but and and if they put put that, like you said, the the creative effort in, they actually those those elements are reusable in the, in their stream. So it's not like yeah, they have oh to yeah, 
you know, just like in the screencast tools, you have the ability to make them library assets or, you know, and, 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 and leverage what you have there. So Steve, if we could take a second, I want to, um, there's a few questions we have in here. Yep. I, I've, I've noticed I want to share first. Um, thank you. Wow. We got quite the crowd here. Thank, um, thank you, Ivan and uh, Top Shelf VA. That's Naomi, Michael Daniels, Simply Beth, Ivan, and um, Harley and Les. I'm just saying hello to a lot of these people. Dan Norton, thank, thanks for coming out, everybody. And um, let's see. And I see Jason there. Uh, hi, Jason. And Crypto Cruising. And so th th Naomi asks here, uh, let me just bring this one up for us, uh, Steve. She says, um, "Sorry, I'm 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 bouncing all about trying to catch up. Do you think there should be a limit on time for live streams that make them fully uh, effective, such as thirty to sixty minutes, but no longer?" Yeah, I think it depends where you are and what your community is like, and if it's a regularly scheduled thing versus a one-off thing. I I always look at the length of video as how long is a piece of string. How long does it take you to to create exactly what it is you're looking for? I mean, I have friends who do live streams that are five and six hours long. They're crazy. <laughs> uh, but it does a great job for them building their community. You, you know, do you remember when we were doing, um, oh, what was it called now? Uh, the four quadrants. Oh, I've lost the name. We were coming live stream. Oh, good Blab? heavens. Blab? Blab. Do you yeah. remember when we do blabs? And it was just we were like in the hangout together. Yeah. And you know, you can spend an hour or two hours or twenty minutes and you just kind of pop in and pop out. It was like a it was like a, a, a cool place to hang out. The, the, there is that sort of a live stream which is very chill and conversational. And then there's purpose built. You see people on Facebook that do like a weekly or a daily little snippet tutorial. They're in and out, they're focused, they have a call to action, they do 20 minutes and it, they really serve their community well. It depends on your audience, mm -hmm. you know. So I would say if you're trying to teach something of value, if you're getting people, you know, in the middle of a business day like we are today, you know, keeping them under an hour is definitely a good idea. I would say probably the sweet spot would be 25 to 40 minutes. However, having said that, there's a momentum to live streams. The problem with live streams is people don't come on right away at the beginning and it interrupts their day. Now, Gord, fortunately, promotes this is coming up so people can destination view much like you would a webinar. Uh, but it's you know, so people come with intent that they know what the topic is going to be like and watch. Whereas if we're talking about Facebook, typically it's, you know, all of a sudden so-and-so has gone live because they're bored and they <laughs> say, oh, no, I'll do a, I'll do a live stream. And at that particular case, they have nothing of value and they're just babbling on saying what's happening, you know, that sort of stuff. Then, then, you know, I, I don't see tremendous value in it. But if I had to pick a time, 30 to 45 minutes sounds great. Yeah. Uh, I, for my live streams, for my webinars, which I consider to be live streams, I try and keep them under an hour. Um, and that's, that's the sweet spot as far as I'm concerned. Well, that, that's, that, that's great. That, that sounds like good, uh, practical advice. I I've had habit of going on longer, just allowing things to go where the conversation goes, but I'm, I'm learning more and trying to get better at respecting the viewer's time, as you just say. And that's mm -hmm. something that, uh, I guess you grow to appreciate as you, build the community and, and, and connect with them more. Right. And, and yep. learn from, from what they're, they're looking for. So, so Steve, um, how do you suggest people go about making the decision on whether they should be starting with something like a screencasting tool or whether they should be looking to dive into something like a, you know, a final cut pro or premier pro. Uh, Cause I find I talk to a lot of people and they are like, um, you know, they may may have heard of more of the, those, you know, the more extensively skilled technologies like the Premiere Pro and Final Cut Pros, and they, they really just want to get their their videos done and be creative. They don't want to become a highly skilled editor. And I find it very interesting because many I know have tried and then they end up in like Camtasia or, or, or ScreenFlow after they try you know, yeah. and some go the other way, but like, what, 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 what would you advise people on how to work through that? I would say if you're, if you're, if you know that you're going to be an artistic video, that you're going to be doing lots of outside DSLR work and video work and drone footage and that kind of stuff, you probably are this person that should be looking at one of the higher end tools. 
But if you're going to be creating tutorial videos and training videos and videos that are primarily designed for YouTube that are explainer videos or, or along that line, you should use one of the more accessible tools like Screenflow or Camtasia. Yeah. So for things like um, if, if you're, you know, a video marketer and you, you want to produce oh, a lot of stuff, yeah. I mean... Screenflow, you're fine. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you, Absolutely. You, you don't really need to go beyond that kind of no, level. No, not at all. Is, is what I'm thinking. And yeah, because um, yeah, I find that, you know, a lot of the people that I help um, come to me and we start to talk about what kind of product or solution they should get to do their, their editing. And then when I find out, you know, some will emphatically say, uh, I don't really want to be an editor. I just want to get my content out. Yeah. And, and and then there are the ones like you describe. Man, I'm I'm all in on this creative thing, and I want to, you know, really really dive deep. So it's a bit of a, a longer learning curve, but that investment, I guess, will help them get there for their creative goals in the long run. Yeah. Right? One would hope. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I'm just curious about the, the the camera technology, the webcams and different stuff. Like you, you've tried a bunch of the things now. So for screencasting and 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 the capability for that, like, what is your thought about the necessity of 4K? I don't think that's ne necessary, really. Um, not not for the stuff that we do on webcasting and screencasting. Uh, I use the, although I guess it is a 4K camera, I think it is, is the Logitech Brio, which is a $150 camera. Uh, that's what I'm on right now. Way more important than the camera. You can do, do fine with like the Logitech C920, their old high definition webcam. Yeah. But make sure you have good light. You yeah, know, that's I've what I'm using light. right now is the C920. Yeah. And with you look lighting. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's, um, you know. I want to yeah, don't, don't get more than you need. I yeah. mean, th there are some nice ways to be able to set up like a DSLRs. If you want like a nice bokeh, you want a nice, you know, kind of blurred out background and that sort of stuff. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at some point in the near future, I plan to upgrade my camera more because out of boredom and just trying to tweak things. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't think that you or anybody else is going to say, oh, wow, Steve's videos are so much better now that his background is blurry. Uh, yeah. You know, he has a shallower depth of field. But because I sit there and I have to stare at it all the time as I'm editing, it'll make me happy. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to be um, in your vlog? You mentioned drones and other things, so it looks like you're going to be diving deeper into some of uh, the, um, you know, yeah, deeper know. editing stuff, or you kind of see how that goes once I you start to create? I started out thinking I was going to do that when I started the vlog, but I also, you know, I would go out and I would shoot my vlog more elaborately, and people do enjoy it, but it didn't get a lot more views. And I finally asked my audience, I said, do you just like me sitting here and talking? And they said, we like you just sitting there and talking. So, you know, it, it's a lot easier for me if I don't have to go out and try and figure out a location and figure out something going on. Because I don't, I'm not out and about as much as I used to be. I mean, if you, my, my going out and about is walking my dog Farley or going to the gym. So, uh, so and then when I'm on the road, I, I find it hard to vlog on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the same way that, you know, some of our, some of our other peers do. I, I, and that's something I'd like to do more of. But I don't, I need to see a business case behind it as well and see that it's actually creating more traction with my community. So I will dabble with it, but I'm not going to commit to, I'm not going to commit to, I'm certainly not buying a drone in the next <laughs> little while. I'm going to be running around Ladin or taking establishing shots of the drone flying by me on the river. And I, 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 I'm, I'm always amazed though, when I see those that do the drone shots, how, how they oh. even get by the legal issues. Cause a lot of them are in places you just know it's prohibitive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. We've got, uh, I've got <clears throat> flying zones close to me, but I'm pretty close to several airports, actually Vancouver international airport. So almost, I can almost see it from here. So I have to be a little bit careful. Yeah. How important is the set in, in, in when you're doing, um, obviously the kind of content you, you do, because I know you did a lot of tweaks to come up with what you have and, and yeah. like, what are your thoughts actually on I just that? realized my dog's toys are on the floor back there, but kind of like, <laughs> he's on the floor right here. Um, I spent a lot of time figuring out how to put this background together for this, for this, because I used to do all green screen, which mm -hmm. is fine. And green screens are great because it superimposes your face over top of the, when you're doing tutorial videos and it was nice, but, and it's a good technique to use, but people felt they had a more intimate connection with me mm -hmm. here in my office. 
So we moved just a year ago, actually, just a year ago in December, we moved into this new location. So it took me a little while to kind of set this living, to, to set it up so that it looked the way I want it to look. So, you know, I got my, like my YouTube silver play button and I got Farley's bed back there. So Farley's often in and out of the shots. Yeah. And people like that oh, access. Yeah. They like that access to your real life. You know, and I got pictures of me fishing and, you know, little pieces of memorabilia. You know, people don't know it. But if you look down there on the bottom shelf, mm -hmm. there are two pieces of software that I started in the industry with. One is a beta version of Quark Express, which was a desktop <laughs> publishing tool that I used at the very beginning. And the other is Macromind Director 1.0, which was the first animation software that I ever used for interactive animation. And so there's a little piece of history there. There's also a series of videotapes there on the bottom shelf that are the different formats of videotape that we used all the years that I did my TV show when we used to go, when we used to record on tape. And my dad's slide rules back there and his old Bolex camera. So there's lots of, mm. you know, there's lots of kind of Easter eggy type pieces that yeah. might not mean anything to anybody else, but mean a lot to me. And in the odd time, somebody says to me, is that Quark Express there on the bottom of your shelf? And <laughs> people will recognize those sorts of things. So it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. I even saw you went um, and showed in one of your, your webinars that you were even exploring like multiple camera angles and you had a, yeah. a, a, a like an iPhone set up and on a tripod and you were going to yeah. experiment with that. And we can do that. And when I go live stream, well, just like you can with OBS, uh, if we start doing live streams, I might set up multiple camera angles, but there's not much else. It's not that interesting here uh, because typically speaking, you know, if you have a second person on like I'm here, you've got what you're looking for as far as, you know, we're doing a one shot or a two shot type thing. But my office is pretty small. There's just not that many interesting angles. It's pretty much a one shot wonder. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you introduced it, but I guess um, it also creates a... a, a a lot more work in the editing and post, right? If you're going to be mixing stuff in and cutting and sewing yeah. together. <laughs> so that on makes a, it a bit easier. On, yeah. a week, on a weekly kind of commitment, it's it's an interesting an interesting challenge. Yeah. So so Steve, um, what's what's coming up next for you? Um, the the pod, post, podcast launch is this week. Like you did yeah, an episode first... zero, if I recall, sort of like outlining what that's all about and. Uh, Yes, I've, I'll put this in. I there we do, there we go. Here's a link to the uh, podcast. Uh, yeah, we've got episode zero of the new podcast called Gray Matters. Oh, sorry, just a minute. Mm -hmm. I've got a guy coming to install a wireless device. Oh, okay. I'm just gonna just sorry. That's okay. Steve Dotto. Good. How are you doing? While we're waiting for Steve, thank you everybody yeah, hi, for the great conversation that's going on there in. Uh, in, in the chat and um, okay, I'm home now. Actually, I'll let you in, and I'm just in the middle of doing a live stream. But I'll let you in, and you can you know where to, what to do. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. My installer's here a few minutes early, so, so can you give me two seconds sure. Jordan, while I go, go let ahead, him in? Go ahead, Steve. -O. Okay. <laughs> this is this is a first for me. This is cool. <laughs> well, you, you can fill. This is this is yeah. I'm gonna we're, learn. We're gonna test your uh, we're gonna test your ability. And Farley's gonna go nuts. My dog is about to wake up. I'll oh, be right okay. back. Okay. Okay. Getting a Bluetooth thermostat involved, installed in it, wireless Bluetooth thermostat. Yeah. So uh, hi, hi everyone. Thank thank you all for being here. And um, I noticed that the chat's been, been very active. And Brad's sharing with everyone here about uh, the amazing price of the C920. Just so that everyone knows, that's the camera I'm on right now. And I believe you know the quality is quite sufficient as long as you have ample lighting and the white balance and you've set various things that you can to tweak the settings on the camera you're going to get a great result so you know unless you really need um you know to have the, the resolution at an extra high capability and depending on the software you're using for editing you may or may not be able to take advantage of that um you know something like this the c920 or the c922 is you know quite good i believe naomi's using the the c922 because she recently got one because her uh, her previous one kind of died out uh, hi Ivan, hi Simply Beth and um, Brad from the Friedman Group and Car Galaxy Studios. Yeah, everyone loves the C920. I'm seeing that and so um, I think that's a pretty safe bet for most people to um, to get to, to you know, spruce up their quality of um, what, what they're doing. And I'm just catching through, catching up on the, um, the, the chat, s s seeing here who all's here. Okay, that's great. 
Yeah, and, and Neo mentioned, yeah, earlier on that we're talking about length of time for live streams and that the Nimmin sort of like set an incredibly long standard, but they just have so much fun and what they do with the community is something special. And I think the, the co-hosting with D makes it really, you know, m really magical. And, you know, that's been a fun place to be to show on, on any Saturday morning. So it's all fun there hi steve <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that oh yeah how did it go did you fill in well sorry about that yeah i'm, sorry. I'm I, getting I, uh i've got this internet based or wireless thermostat that we're installing for our baseboard heater so that i can adjust the you know you, you can program it and you can see all the stuff it was this i wanted to try out the tech but the guy has to install them oh yeah 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 so um um Crypto Cruising here says he's using a Brio and he changed from the C930E and he, he loves it. And I think you, you've you commented before how you really like the quality of the Brio, right? Yeah, especially on the Mac. The drivers are so much better on the Mac. Oh, okay. So, so we can do white balancing better and we can do color correction and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I do. Are, have you played, like I know you have a, a course where you go through... Um, is it in the webinars course, Steve, where you, you look at a lot of the, um, uh, the platforms like Zoom, Be Live, all the comp, oh, or is that a separate thing? You, you annually do a whole webinar. Is that the Webinar Palooza or is it something else? Yeah, I do something called Webinar Palooza where we actually test, not Be Live, but we test all of the webinar platforms. Right. And we do it like a pub crawl from one platform to another platform. And so it's a free mini course as well that I've got. Let me just find it here. And uh, just a minute. So it is a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a course that, uh, that tests and works with each one of the webinar platforms individually so you can see which one is best for you. Because not all webinar platforms are created equal. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are very good. Like we're using Zoom to interface here. Some of them are really good for for uh, robust uh, feed, but they don't necessarily, like Zoom doesn't allow you to do hybrid webinars. It doesn't allow you to insert video. Right. They expect to insert video from your desktop and then stream it up and encode it rather than other platforms that allow you to upload your video to YouTube and then stream from YouTube and do an insert, which is far prefer more preferable as far as the technology goes and some of them mm -hmm. do a great job with chat other ones like go to webinar does a terrible job of chat so you so you it's okay if you're doing a slideshow presentation but getting engagement from your audience and getting that social proof of a active chat like we have here mm -hmm. is impossible mm -hmm. um so they've all got strengths and they've all got weaknesses but we test out about seven of them in webinar palooza so it's all there Cool, because I, I remember you doing that. That was one of the quite unique things that you do to, to, to compare them all and, you know, the, the whole gamut, which is yeah. like really yeah. neat. Like I think you, yeah, you you spend- I love like, testing them, yeah. And even in, in even in within the same hour, you go through multiple <laughs> experiences. To yeah, share. yeah. Well, we take people from one webinar platform to another platform. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a crazy, it's a crazy event. And I, I would see that one as, oh my God, this is like anything, anything goes now <laughs> when you're switching yeah, around. It right? doesn't always work out the way we intended. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, we were just, you know, um, bef before the installer came, <laughs> we were just talking about what was coming up next for you. If you, oh. if you could share that about the podcast launch. Yeah. So the podcast launch is the, the first episode of gray matters. The episode zero is up, which just talks about what it is and gets kind of thing makes made. I was making, basically making sure my iTunes feed was in place, et cetera. So that's all that's up now. And I dropped the link in there earlier. I can give it to you again. Uh, but the first episode drops this week. Uh, I'm still playing with the format. I'm not a hundred percent thrilled with the content of the podcast, but I realize it's an evolutionary thing that it's something I got to spend some time doing till I kind of hit the sweet spot. And I really feel that it's, it's where I want, but you know, within five or six episodes, I think we'll get there. So the first, you know, give me, give me grace, give me feedback and tell me what you think of them. But uh, mm -hmm. the first couple of episodes are always awkward because you don't you haven't really hit your stride yet, but I've, I've got the first two recorded and then I'm, uh, I'm going to have the first interview based one in the next week or so. Uh, but we're hoping to drop them every Thursday. Oh, that's cool. So what is your perspective on, 
um, doing something that's totally focused for podcast versus multiple repurposing, like doing a video interview like I'm doing here and potentially converting something like this into podcast content with some kind I, of editing and structure. To yeah, I think that's that. good. I'm going to do that occasionally. I'm going to play with that. I, I, I haven't decided, you know, like where, which podcast should you post on YouTube as well right. as just as a podcast. So what I'm going to do with mine and I'm not saying it's the right way, it's just the way I've decided, is I originally recorded the podcast with video. And then I looked at the video and I said, I don't like it. It's just it's just me talking. And although some people would watch it, I just didn't see the additional value. So I decided not to post those on YouTube. I'm mm. just posting my solo podcasts as podcasts. But when I do an interview with somebody, right. I am going to edit the podcast down quite a bit. Uh, because I don't want them to be too long, uh, but I'm going to do the unedited interview on YouTube. I'm going to post that on YouTube so people can get the raw thing, you know, and, and it might not, it might be, you know, complete without any bleeped out language or any of that. It'll be, it'll be just as we sit down and have the conversation. So uh, is, 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 is what you produce, um, different in the sense that are you working more from like an outline or with notes and with like a, uh, like a, a, fi a fixed structure that you want to get through in a certain amount of time when you're doing your podcast yeah. as compared yeah. each to one's gonna, like each one's when you do have a webinar. A goal. Or, or yeah, a unlike the, the vlog is about sharing ideas and feelings and stuff like that. And it's soft. The podcast mm. is all going to be tactical. I want you to learn the importance of creating a downloadable, you know, creating a list builder for your email list. And I'm going to talk to you about techniques. I want it to be actionable items. So I, I definitely have an agenda for each one of the solo podcasts. The interview right. podcasts we're going to let be a little bit more, uh, but I'm but it's going to be based on what the guest is bringing to the table and getting their message out. So it's kind of in in the middle ground there. Solo podcasts though are going to be definitely be actionable items. Okay, so I guess you'll be screencasting some of those then. I guess when you're interviewing for the potential or recording them somehow. No, I won't be doing any screencasting in this. No. Oh, okay. No, so, not planning on it. No. So it'll be other other kind of stuff visually that you would accompany. Um, well, the the the, the, the the YouTube side of it's only going to be the double ender, just both sides of the interview. Yeah, oh, I see. You know, and it'll be completely unedited. So oh. it'll be it'll be just, and we might stream them live as we do them, depending on it, it, that's going to depend on the sort of traction I get from testing it out. Sure. And I don't I don't know yet. I'm I'm kind of keeping my options open. So when you say that they're going to be um, sort of like tactical educational things are, are you also going to be interviewing you know other boomers like people like in my state trying to make it in the digital world and producing something like or like are you like how how you i'm just curious how it's it's being positioned with the community engaging with it'll the people be, that it'll way be people it'll be authors like. or other it'll be authors or people who are experiencing the experiencing have something to share of value Oh, so see. somebody who's reinvented themselves and what they've gone through, or we'll be talking to somebody who has become a digital nomad and about the expected and unexpected consequences of that. Right. Or we'll be talking, you know, those are the sorts of interviews that I'm kind of thinking of. Nice. Somebody who, okay. you know, somebody who has some really tactical knowledge about email list building, uh, you know, bring them on board. Somebody who has, uh, you know, a knowledge about building a, building a podcast or, you know, other social platforms or, or use it or how, how you use Facebook marketing to baby boomers and Gen X, you know, what are the unique mm. aspects of marketing to our community? Uh, those sorts of, those sorts of guests are what I'll be looking for. Oh, that's very cool. I'm just curious to, to research and come up with stuff that you do for the show. Is that something that you do entirely yourself or do you ha have people that assist you in research work and stuff like that? I'm, I'm asking out of curiosity because, you know, you're at a level of amount of production and stuff that you do weekly. It's quite a load. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do it all myself. Um, but there will, but I'm looking at offloading different aspects of it. Um, for instance, I have, you know, I, I'm starting by right, doing the whole thing myself, but the very first thing that I'm going to bring on is somebody to write the show notes mm. and to create the blog posts, right? And then the next person that comes on will be, I'll hand off the editing of the podcast. Um, gotcha. You know, once, I, once I've got it sounding the way I want and with the energy and the rhythm that I want, um, then I'll pass it on. You know, I'll pass those things off as time goes by. But I think it's really important for any entrepreneur at the beginning to have their hands on every aspect of the production. Uh, cause they have to know what works and what doesn't work 
and how yeah. much effort it takes to get there and what the payoff is. So it's, it's no different than, you know, incorporating a new tool in your, in, in, in your system, making sure that you've got, a, you know, everything in place. I, I could see a podcasting course coming from Steve at some point to help help the boomers. Maybe probably more <laughs> videos. I'm not sure I'm going to develop a lot of more of my uh, my own courses. I yeah. I tend to look for other people who already do a good course and then recommend them to my community and 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 work with them from that perspective. I'm doing a I'm doing a course launch in January with Amy Porterfield, where she's mm. launching a brand new course on webinars and online course creation, and I'm going to add my screencasting component to that course. Oh, nice. So, because I think she does a terrific job of teaching the marketing skills, and I know I do a terrific job of teaching the technical skills. So, right. will so I, I will sell her course and work as an affiliate for her, and it works out good for both of us. Well, that sounds great. I like that. Yeah. So, so Steve, th- thanks so much for jo- joining us today. I've enjoyed. It was, it was, sorry I'm about really... the sorry about the interruption, the real life interruption in the middle. <laughs> that that that's cool. I I didn't get phased. Maybe if it was my first or second experience, yeah. Good but now I, now I'm a veteran at about you know ten to fifteen <laughs> interviews. But, Excellent. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and and I greatly appreciate it. And and I'm sure there's a lot of um, you know good replay value in this. And I hope a lot of people check it out because uh, it was great to talk to you today about cool. screencasting, learning about you know where you're headed and and how you share some cool stuff. And I'm you know excited to see what comes. Thank you, well, Steve. thanks for the opportunity to share with your community, and uh, we'll have to do this again. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's a pleasure to um, bring you another live show with a great guest like Steve, and, and I look forward to bringing more interesting guests as we go forward. And have a nice day, everyone. Are we done?